In this video, we're going to see how to model method calls in the Java programming language with the UML sequence diagram. Now, why do we want a sequence diagram? A lot of times, if we take a look at a program, we'll see a whole bunch of method calls and constructor calls, like up here we have a constructor call, and then down here we have some method calls. And as our program gets longer and longer, it can be a bit difficult to track what exactly is going on with these method calls. And even more to the point, many times we want to plan out these method calls in advance, and this is where the sequence diagram comes into play. In this video, I'm going to model our driver program with a prompt user method and the main method and also a driver and a vehicle class by using Argo UML's sequence diagram. I'm going to explain step by step the diagram that you're looking at here. To create this, I simply chose create and then new sequence diagram. So with that, let's get started. The first thing that we're going to see is a lifeline. What you'll see at the very top is a rectangular box and many times a slash and then a variable name, a colon, and then a type where the type would be the variable type. And remember in object-oriented programming that a variable type can either be a primitive or it can be a class. In a sequence di diagram, the variable type is almost always going to be a class of some kind because you can only call methods on classes, you cannot call methods on primitives. So variable name in this case is your vehicle and the type is vehicle. And sure enough, if we take a look at our program, what do we see on line 32? But we're declaring a variable named your vehicle and that variable is declared of type vehicle. So underneath this rectangular box, you see the kind of a vertical line, a lifeline. This is where we can put method calls that originate from this object. And they will go in sequential order so that we can read them from top to bottom in the order in which they will execute. One common call is a self call. This is where an object invokes a method on itself. Now what's interesting about this is this typically happens. Say you're in, uh, well say for example you're in class driver and we're in the main method and we want to invoke the prompt user method. You notice that all we need to do to invoke the prompt user method is type out the method signature for prompt user and follow it by a semicolon. We do not need to proceed it with a variable name. If you look down on line 35 through 37, you see some method calls that are preceded by a variable name. Those are different method calls because those are calling out to other objects. In a self call, we are within an object and we are invoking a method that is also within the same object. So prompt user, I'm sorry, the main method here is invoking prompt user. Because the prompt user method is essentially a sibling to the main method and it's in the same class, we do not have to precede this method call with a reference to an object. When I say reference to an object, many times you can just think variable. So we don't have to proceed prompt user with a variable. We model this in UML, whoops, we model this in UML with a call like so. So you see we're coming down from driver, we're coming down this lifeline, and we make a call on ourselves. And you see a little box pops out, and then that, in, that indicates the time in which our prompt user method is running. When the prompt user method is finished, we then have this dashed line that comes back and indicate that the prompt user method has finished. Also notice off to the right, we have a label that tells us that this is the prompt user method call. That's probably the easiest type of method call to begin with, because you don't require another object. All you require is multiple methods within the same class to do a self-call. Here's what it looks like in code, and we just saw this in our example. You see we have the public static void main method, and then we're invoking the prompt user method, which is a method declared below. Now, if we do want to invoke methods on another object, one nice thing is it's going to open up a whole lot of opportunities for us, and it's going to make us easier to write our program. But to invoke a method on another object, we have to create another object, and this is when the create action comes in handy. So take a look at the sequence events that are happening here. We start with driver, and from the main method we invoke the prompt user method. From the prompt user method, now we're doing a create call, and look at what's happening here. We have a solid line with a solid triangular arrow, and it's pointing to yet another lifeline, but this lifeline has a different name, the name is my vehicle, and a different type, the type is vehicle. By different, I mean it's different from the object that's invoking it. So driver is creating an object of type vehicle. 
Note that this is an, a particularly important call because this is creating a brand new lifeline, which means that we can start to invoke methods from driver to vehicle. And then vehicle can continue on and invoke methods of its own if it wishes. So this is a create call. If we take a look in code, it's simply a constructor call like we see here. Vehicle my vehicle equals new vehicle. To see that in context, we see on line number 30 in prompt user, vehicle my vehicle equals new vehicle. Now, once we have an object up and ready to use, we store it into a variable, and then we can invoke methods on that object by invoking them on the variable. There are two principal ways in which we can invoke a method on another object. One is an asynchronous method call, and this is where we invoke a method and we do not want, we do not care about hearing back. We're not going to wait for it. We're going to maybe push something out to a service and we're going to trust that that service is work, going to work. We can continue to perform work on our own while that service is also doing the work we've told it to do. If that's a bit difficult to comprehend, I understand because it's a bit difficult to explain. So let me give you an analogy. This is one that I've used in several other videos, but uh, in the old days, if you wanted to go see a game show like The Price is Right uh, before the internet, what you would do is you would get an envelope and make it out to yourself and put a stamp on it. You would take that envelope, put it in a bigger envelope, make the bigger envelope out to The Price is Right, Hollywood, California, drop it in the mailbox. So that your mail would arrive at The Price is Right, they would open it, they would see the envelope inside of the envelope. And the envelope inside of the envelope is addressed back to you. So they would put tickets to The Price is Right in that inner envelope and then drop that in the mailbox and send it back to you. So just take the very first part. Assume that you're dropping something in the mailbox. When you drop something in the mailbox, do you then freeze up until you hear back? Or do you go about your day and you get a sandwich and you go to work and other things? Well, you get a sandwich and you go to work and do other things because the mail carrier is going to pick up that, that mail for you. The mail carrier is going to uh, basically affect the delivery of that mail to Hollywood, California separately while you go about your daily work. So that is an asynchronous method call. Now, some asynchronous method calls are just fire and forget. That would be something like dropping a card to a friend. You might drop a birthday card in the mail and the friend might say thanks, but maybe it's someone you haven't heard from in a while and uh, maybe you won't hear back from that friend for a while. So that would be a fire and forget. Uh, in other asynchronous method calls, they will call you back and say, hey, I've received your letter and here's my response. Uh, that's the example of sending off for the tickets to The Price is Right, where you drop your mail in the, you know, you drop the self-addressed stamped envelope in the mail, and maybe a week or two later, you get it back in the mail from The Price is Right with tickets inside. But in the week or two that elapsed, you were able to continue working. So uh, hearing back is what we'll call a callback. Not hearing back is what we'll call a fire and forget. We can represent an asynchronous method call with an arrowhead that is just made up of lines but not a solid triangle. I've taken a little bit of liberty here because the exact code example that we have is invoking set gallons of gas, set miles per gallon, and set odometer on the object that's stored in the variable called your vehicle. These actually do have to wait for one method to complete before the next method starts. So this is not truly asynchronous. Truly asynchronous would be calling a separate process or calling a separate thread. But I use these as an example because we're passing data into the setter methods, but we're not getting data back from the setter methods. So we don't need to wait for them. We could make this asynchronous if we wanted to. So, what's not asynchronous? Well, synchronous is not asynchronous. In synchronous, uh, we are invoking a method and we're going to wait until we hear back from that method before we can proceed. So, in this case, think that you live in Hollywood and instead of mailing and requesting tickets for The Price is Right, you just walk up to The Price is Right's uh, ticket office and you wait in line until you get your tickets. In that case, there's not much else that you can do while you're waiting in line. So you wait in line, you get your tickets. Once you get your tickets, then you can go about your day, then you can go get lunch, then you can go get your groceries, so on and so forth. So that's an example of a synchronous method call. And in UML, we'll diagram this with the capped arrow out and an open arrow back. So in this case, you see the go method. For the go method, we're calling out to the vehicle class, uh, or sorry, the, the, uh, the my vehicle object, 
and we're hearing back from it with this return right here. So that is a synchronous call where we're making a call and we're waiting to hear back from the call. An example of a synchronous call is myvehicle.go. Perhaps we could get some return value for this, or perhaps we're not willing to be able to uh, continue on with more work until this Go method has finished processing. An even better example I can show you, and one that you're probably used to, especially if you've seen the debugger, is this one right here. Remember J Option Pane Show Input Dialog? If you've ever used the debugger in your program, you notice that when it gets to a J Option Pane Show Input Dialog, it will not allow you to go to the next step until the user has entered some information. So that's an example of a synchronous method call. Sorry, that's an example of a pause synchronous method call, not an asynchronous method call. Finally, we'll take a look at a destroy action. This is often used when you want to clean up some memory. So in this case, one object is destroying another object by essentially taking it out of scope. Remember what scope is. Scope says that a variable is alive from a point where it is declared until the close curly of the location where it's declared. In our prompt user method, you'll see here that we are declaring my vehicle right here on line 30 within the prompt user method. So that means that that vehicle is available in the entire area I've highlighted in blue, but we deallocate it. In other words, we reclaim the memory at the end of line 77. So to show this in UML, we will go from one lifeline to another with a call, and on the object that we're essentially reclaiming, it's going to terminate with an X. So if we take, whoops, uh, if we take a look here, you see the driver is going to terminate this uh, my vehicle that we have right here. So this fills out the sequence diagram for the driver and vehicle, specifically my vehicle objects that we've used in our program. This is a complete sequence diagram. I do want to demonstrate how to draw this, and that's okay. I can do that and expand on our example a little bit. You'll notice in our program that we declare an object of type vehicle and we save it into a variable name of my vehicle, which is what we just described. But we also create an object of vehicle and we store it into a variable named your vehicle. And then we invoke methods on your vehicle. Now this is important because remember our UML diagram, what we have in these lifelines is the variable name and then a colon and the variable type. If we have two different variable names, they should each have their own lifeline because they're each going to have their own state. In other words, methods can be called on only one at a time and we might pass different values to those methods. So my vehicle might have 100,000 miles on the odometer where your vehicle might have 20,000 miles on the odometer and we want to keep those values separate. Now, I'm not necessarily going to go in the exact order as I have in the program, uh, but I will just show, I'm going to kind of show these as separate activities. So uh, first of all, let's go ahead and make the lifeline for your vehicle. And we'll see up at the top, I'm going to type a slash on the question mark key in the US keyboard, say your vehicle, and then a colon, and then vehicle. So I indicate the variable name and also the variable type. Now it looks a little bit funny because it's kind of up here on the top, and we know that we don't create your vehicle until after we've gone into prompt user and after we've created my vehicle. So again, I'm going to kind of, uh, and actually this guy needs to move up. Okay, the destroy action needs to move up. So I'm going to just assume that the creation of your vehicle uh, happens after my vehicle and all these method calls happen afterwards also, which it, they, they don't happen in that exact order, but it will help help me to keep this clean. So first of all, how do we take this lifeline and move it down so that we can show the relationship where driver calls the prompt user method, the main method from driver calls prompt user, and then prompt user is what actually creates vehicle. Well, what we need to do for that is we need to simply mouse over until we see the new create action. And from our driver class, let's click and drag, and I'm holding the left mouse button, and then drop. And you see, as soon as I do that, it moves this lifeline down and it says, okay, well, your vehicle does not even become alive until this point in programming. Okay, now after this, uh, I've created the vehicle. And after this, I can do my series of method calls. So I can do my send action and we can simply drag and drop and say set odometer. Indicate a method call there. Oops, 
And I had a little trick getting the name just right up here, but that's okay. I can drag this guy at the bottom up and where you see name, I can type in set odometer, just like so. And now we see the set odometer method call. And now we can do a new, uh, let's see, let's do a new send action. And again, drag from one object to the other. And for this one, we'll say set miles per gallon. And let's do one more send action. And on this one, we'll say set gallons of gas. Oops, and we'll go do that down here. Okay, and then again, we know we're going to invoke the method go. So for this, we'll do a call action, just like so. And you see that the call action gives us the call out and also the response back. Remember, that indicates a synchronous call. So we'll say go. And then after we've done the call action, let's do the destroy action, just like so. So I drag from the bottom and I drag it from the bottom of my prompt user method out to this your vehicle method. Notice as soon as I do that, the your vehicle, sorry, the your vehicle uh, lifeline rather, shrinks and terminates with an X to indicate that this has gone out of scope and now it's going to be cleaned up from memory. After that, the prompt user method is essentially done. So the prompt user method returns back to the main method of the class driver and essentially the sequence of method calls is now complete. As you see we can get a good visualization of when driver is available, when we invoke, uh, when we create an object of my vehicle, of type vehicle, when we invoke methods on that object stored in the variable my vehicle, and then when that my vehicle goes out of scope. We can also see that uh, the your vehicle, the variable your vehicle holding a vehicle object, that comes into scope here when it's created. We call a series of methods on it, then we destroy it, we remove it from memory, and then the prompt user method is complete, and we return back to driver. So in this video, we've seen how to model method calls with our UML sequence diagram. In our next video, I'll show kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of this diagram and a look at the debugger on how these methods are actually called. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.